welcome. You're tuned into the best in true crime talk radio. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Tim Dennis. Tim, things are getting exciting for fans of the show. Yes, they are. Listen, uh, we are now very, very close to this takeover and changeover happening. And for those of you that have been subscribing, we mentioned this last week on the show. I'm going to re-mention it again. We thank you for your love and support to continue the show going. For the $5 a month that you've been subscribing, you've been getting, we believe, a very good show for the last three, four years. Well, what if that $5 could go even further for you? What if now when you subscribe to True Crime Tuesday, not only do you get our show, but it opens the door to Pandora's box of multitudes of different shows that you can actually get. Um, And that's what happens with true crime tuesday we're going to be moving over this new platform very soon we'll be uh, continually announcing it until the transition takes over and when it does uh we will no longer be here on patreon so we we appreciate you continuing to follow us here and we will continue to deliver the episodes and then let you know specifically what week is our final week and then join us over at our new home we'll be uh, putting more information out on that if you want to make sure you don't miss out on it Email me, Dave at darknessradio.com. Dave at darknessradio.com. And we will email you when the transition takes place. So you'll be able to find our new home and ways to subscribe. Is that is that right, Tim? Or I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this is rolling over. Are subscribers, it's going to be that simple for them, right? It should be. It'll, it'll be something similar to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, keep you informed as to uh, what... Uh what will take place or maybe a, a brief period where you, you may have to re-sign up, but yeah, it, it will, uh, it'll be pretty, uh, pretty painless. Yeah. Very painless. We're going to make it as painless as we can so that you could switch right over and follow along with us. And uh, not only will you get true crime Tuesday, but you'll get uh, a bunch of other amazing programs that will be available over there. Let's get started with today's program, uh, Brotherhood Betrayed, the Man Behind the Rise and Fall of Murder Incorporated. Michael Canella, our guest today. Michael, welcome to the show. Oh, hey, thanks for having me, guys. Listen, I thought it was just a kick-ass title of a Bruce Springsteen song. Uh, I had no (laughs) clue what Murder Incorporated was until that song came out in the 80s on a bootleg album. I yep. found it and uh, then started to look into this. But for our listeners who are not familiar with Murder, Inc., can you give us some background? Yeah, I mean, it, it, happened, it happened this way. I'll just kind of back, I'll back way up, if, if, if I may. Um, during um, Prohibition, um, mobsters in New York, Chicago, Miami, Los Angeles... Um, during Prohibition, they didn't have to try very hard to make money. They set up their bootleg operations, and the cash just rolled in. They had they had a monopoly, and they had a very thirsty American uh, constituency and uh, clientele. When Prohibition ended, um, things changed. Uh, the organized crime had to become more organized. And that coincided with a generational shift. So when when organized crime, when prohibition ended, um, a new generation of mobsters came to power. Well, let, uh, let me ask you this, if I could, Michael. Prior to prohibition, how strong was the mob in America? It seems like you know, from everything we've watched in Hollywood movies, and certainly I was a Cagney aficionado, right? It seems like the mob really came to its power during that struggle. Um, But were they a force already to be reckoned with prior to the prohibition issues? I would say they were a force, but nothing, nothing like the force that they were in prohibition and after. I mean, criminals of this kind before prohibition, they were neighborhood guys. They were neighborhood thugs. They were... They were doing holdups. They were doing sort of petty crimes. They were nuisances. But prohibition, during prohibition, they formed alliances. They had enough money to pay off not just the cops, but um, municipal officials. So all of a sudden, they were really a force to be reckoned with. They had set up supply chains. They were cooperating with each other vertically, but also 
you know, uh, from, from city to city. So it was really prohibition that kind of made the mafia what we think of the mafia today. And the mafia at that time was, during prohibition, was still controlled by the old, the old Italian guys who had come to America, the guys from, from um, Sicily and, and Naples. And these were, these were guys who had come here, not, not particularly because they were interested in becoming Americans, but because they were fleeing prosecution in Italy. And there was no extradition arrangements at that time. So if they could get to New York or get to Chicago, they knew that they were not going to be sent back to Italy. They never really wanted to be Americans. You know, they never, as I say in the book, they never drank beer and watched baseball. They were still, they were still old Sicilian guys drinking wine in Sicilian restaurants, even when they lived in, in America. And they did not want to work with each other. The guys from Naples did not want to work with the guys from Sicily. They did not want to work with the Irish gangs. They did not want to work with the Jewish gangs. They did not want to work with the black gangs. They were very, very parochial, and they were very much about running their little particular business, and they were about vendettas. They were about grudges. Um, now, when this the next generation of mobsters came along, they wanted to do away with that. Uh, they wanted to uh, run the the gang. They wanted to run organized crime as a proper American business. They wanted to run it efficiently, and they wanted to make money. And so the first thing that they did is they killed off all the old guys. They called these old guys mustache peats, and they systematically killed off all the old guys, and they... And they uh, and they took over. And um, part of their business plan was to eliminate anybody who could testify against them. Anybody who was an informant or could be an informant. And so they hired uh, a gang in, in Brooklyn, a Jewish gang, headed by a man named Abe Reles. And they were a very efficient assassination squad. And so if one of the consortium gangs in Chicago or Los Angeles had a problem with somebody in their ranks, they would call Abe Reles. And Abe Reles would send one of his men to Miami or Chicago, and they would kill this person very efficiently, really in a very business-like way. And the, um, the Abe Reles himself called his operation the combination because it was really a Jewish-Italian alliance. But a newspaper ref reporter called, nicknamed the Murder, Inc., and that's the name that stuck. Wow. So the reorganization, the restructuring of the mob, trying to turn it into a legitimate, illegitimate business, right? That was kind of the the genesis of what they were hoping to do. That's what they were trying to do. And I think their ultimate goal was really to transition into legitimate businesses. Although that, you know, that did happen, but on a relatively modest, on a modest scale. But they, these were, these were gangsters who had grown up together on the lower East side and in Brooklyn, they were born in America they had a kind of American idea of the melting pot. So, um, you know, Meyer, Meyer Lansky, the J Jewish mobster, he was, he was friends. He had grown up on the Lower East Side with a lot of the Italian, the Italian mobsters. And, you know, they dated each other's sisters. They went to the same school. So they didn't, they didn't have the same kind of prejudices that, that those old mustache Pete's had, and they really had an American idea about this being for profit. And as one of them said, the dollar bill does not know the difference between Jews and Italians. Now, so people have a full understanding, Michael, of how powerful this organization is. And it seemed to be becoming more inclusive, uh, right? I mean, certainly we know that uh, many different, um, the, the Irish, the Jewish, the Italian mobs all seem to be working together 
uh, a little bit better after prohibition and after that aspect, or was that a facade again, that's been painted for us by, um, by Hollywood history? No, they definitely were working together. And it's because of this younger generation was, you know, had grown up together and they were more inclined to, they were more inclined to collaborate across ethnic lines. What they really cared about was, was profit. They were, they were American in the sense that they wanted to run things efficiently and, and for, for profit. And they were willing to work across, you know, across, uh, Jews and Italians, uh, uh, worked, worked together. This was, this was a, uh, this was a new idea in places like lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, these ethnic groups, these ethnic enclaves all lived, um, close together. And so these young gangsters all knew each other. Um, they had gone to school together. They were, they were friends. And so they were willing to overlook whatever cultural differences they had in a way that the older generation um, was not. And they were about making money. So do you believe that then it was that um, ego, it was that brashness that ended up costing the, um, the organization? You know, the way it had been run in the past, it seemed pretty strong. This kind of inclusive nature and changeover seemed to be, to me, showing these kind of dents in the armor? Or was it because it was now being built on the foundering, you know, um, foundation of what had been placed before it? So there was already this steamroller in motion getting ready to to destroy what had been built. Well, the, the, the younger generation considered the older guys to be small time. Uh, the younger generation, like Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky, they looked at the older generation, the men that they had worked for, the men who had um, come to America from Italy, and they, they saw guys who were working, you know, parochially. They were working locally. They were not branching out beyond, you know, uh, beyond um, a few uh, modest size operations in their in their immediate uh, vicinity. That next generation, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, they really, they really were much more ambitious and they wanted to create a national alliance. They wanted to create a kind of national confederacy of, of gangs that would, work, that would work together. They wanted to create like a a, a general motors of crime, a, 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 um, almost a kind of corporate entity that would operate on a national scale. Did they foresee this being, um, truly a form uh, of legitimate business or just more legitimate than what they had been used to? Well, they would have they would have they would have said that it was uh, a form of legitimate business. They would have said that they weren't really doing anything any different than anybody any other American businessmen did, um, except they might have done it had rougher rougher edges. They were you know they were squeezing <laughs> out their competition. They right. were you know uh, making it so that people had to use them. They were. They would have said that they were legitimate business, but of course the businessmen, but of course they really weren't. Um, yeah, they were. Um, but you know, it's they, funny that you bring it up that way because they really, other than more sh physical strong arming, forcing businesses out, closing in on other businesses, running businesses out of business, that's kind of corporate America. Right? It Overtaking is. the weak, crushing them. And at least with the mob, you knew what you were up against the corporate America is even snakier. <laughs> yeah. You know, they seem like they're, you know, patting well, you on the back while shoving the knife in. Well, that's, that's exactly what lucky Luciano would have said. He would have said, we're, you know, at least we're being honest about the way we operate. At least we, at least we're, we're telling you that we're going to blackmail you. <laughs> so, um, whether that's true or not, you know, I don't know. I mean, part of the difference is that, if you were running a garment business in the garment district of New York and they came along and said, oh, we're, we've, we're forming a union and, you know, the union is going to make these demands 
Um, if you didn't go along with the demands, you might go out the window or your inventory might be set on fire uh, or your kids, your kids might be beaten up on their way home from school. So in that sense, they were, they were not like normal businessmen. Well, if you want to get to the, you know, the basics of it, <laughs> right. Yeah. But what a, what a strange world to be a part of, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated by, of course, like most of, of the people in America by mob movies and the Sopranos and watching this kind of business dynamic and, you know, it seems like the ultimate pyramid scheme in some ways with the way the businesses work and the bosses and the soldiers and the, uh, you know, the, the, the godfathers, if you will, that are in charge of each one of the families. It, it seems like this strange kind of pyramid business scheme that would kick money up all the time, you know, and, and that was the way things kept afloat. But this this organize, organization, which is now spreading from coast to coast, and certainly it seems stronger on the East Coast and through Chicago area, was was the mob prevalent in all of the states at one point, or was it just the main thoroughfare states? You know, at one point when they had killed off the mustache Pete's, and it was really Lucky Luciano who had orchestrated that, um, representatives from the various regional mobs met in a hotel in Chicago and Al Capone was their host. I believe it was called the ambassador hotel and they, it was almost like a corporate convention. They, you know, rented the ballroom, they had dinners, they had speeches and, um, everybody expected that lucky Luciano was going to declare himself uh, what was called the boss of bosses. Everybody expected that he was going to be the, the, you know, the head mustache Pete, that he was going to be the next in a long line of these um, Italian bosses to, um, to preside over all of the gangs. And he explained that he didn't want to do that. Instead, he wanted to um, form this um, national um, alliance, as we've as we've discussed, um, which he called, or which way they called, um, the syndicate. And um, so um, it was it was in that in that Chicago hotel that that the sort of membership in this confederacy was solidified. And I I can't remember specifically what cities were represented offhand, but I you know would have been. Chicago, St. Louis, um, Detroit, Miami, um, you know, certainly there were three or four representatives from, from New York, um, Cleveland. Um, so it was, it was about a dozen cities um, were represented. Well, where do we start to see? I mean, obviously, it seems like they're starting to build. They're, they're removing the dead weight. They're building something new, a different structure that is more inclusive and will use the strengths of every ethnicity to build into something else. Where does this start to go wrong other than being on the wrong side of the law? Where does it start to, what, what's the big hiccup? Well, like? I mean, part of what's amazing about this story to me is that it doesn't go wrong for a long time. I mean, this idea of having this confederacy which is enforced by Murder, Inc., uh, worked for about a decade. The idea that they could avoid prosecution by simply killing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of potential informants, it was an idea that really worked. That's the extraordinary part. What happened is that Thomas Dewey, a young prosecutor, um, started to... Um, make inroads in, into, into all of this. And he was appointed a special prosecutor by the governor of New York. And um, he was um, kind of an Elliot Ness figure. He was squeaky clean. He was, I mean, there's a sort of part of this which has just has to do with 
ethnicity. There was he was a Protestant from the Midwest who who represented a view that um, the corruption and violence and crime of East Coast cities was the result of immigrants, Irish and Italians, and it was these. Um, you know, Midwestern Protestants to kind of clean it up. And so um, I think he was not a racist, but he, he was a man of great integrity. But that was sort of the view at the time was was that the American idea, the American enterprise was being corrupted by these Italian guys who came in and introduced their criminal ways from Sicily and Naples. And so... Um, and so Thomas Dewey began slowly to um, find ways to were scared to testify against the mob because they knew what would happen. He convinced them that he would protect them. And that was not an easy thing to do because all evidence was that if you cooperated with a district attorney, if you cooperated with the police, the mob was going to come and get you. Murder Inc. was going to come and get you. Um, but he he succeeded. And he eventually um, went on to run for unsuccessfully for, um, for president twice. But that fight that he had waged to prosecute the mob was later picked up by William O'Dwyer, who was the um, district attorney in in Brooklyn. And like all of these district attorneys, like Thomas Dewey, William O'Dwyer had great political aspirations, political ambitions. And the best way for them to get ahead in politics was to make a name for themselves as mob busters. The guy who could put the mobsters in jail was the guy who was going to be elected mayor, governor, president. And so that's, that was sort of the game that they were playing, was bust the mob and you, you, could, you could get elected. We could see that didn't work for Elliot Ness, though, right? I mean, in his retirement, he tried to ride that wave of breaking Capone. Yeah. And, never, and you know, kind of seemed to get that same kind of acclaim or, or trust of the the American public. It didn't work. It didn't work for Thomas Dewey particularly either. I mean, he went on to become governor of New York, but he, he was expected to be president of the United States. You, you remember that famous um, photo of, of Harry Truman hold a newspaper cover saying Dewey wins. And in fact, Dewey had not won. Truman had won the, the election. Um, so it didn't really work for it didn't work for 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 Dewey either, and maybe you know didn't work maybe for Giuliani either. Giuliani, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani kind of was a latter day version of, in a way, of of these prosecutors. All right, with this kind of violent nature i mean how bad was it was it still a bloodbath in the streets where you know rival gangs murdering each other or was everybody kind of compliant and coming underneath this umbrella understanding their place and their position it was a bloodbath i mean it was really really bloody you know because what happened is that when um when the people who were either part of the mob or peripherally associated with the mob, um, when they began to cooperate to protect themselves, then then this whole situation intensified and Murder, Inc. came after them with complete vengeance. And this, this really happened when um, Lucky Luciano... It was clear that Lucky Luciano was going to be indicted, that he would be put to trial. He went into hiding. And then it was Murder, Inc.'s job to find and kill everybody who could 
testify against Lucky Luciano so that he could come back out of hiding and resume his role as the head of this mob confederacy. And so almost, you know, almost every week um, for this, this period of a couple of years, somebody who worked in gambling or in the garment district in New York, um, they would disappear or their body would be found. Um, many of these bodies were, were um, buried in the Catskills area of upstate New York. And there was a there was a period when the farmers, you know, half jokingly said that they didn't want to plow their fields because every time they plowed their fields, they found a body. Oh, the bodies, good God. Were, the bodies were just appearing everywhere. There was a there was a, a mobster who was stationed in the Catskills to run gambling operations. And he was found to be uh, um, he was found found to be skimming profits. And so, of course, he had to go. And um, he was stabbed to death in a car with an ice pick by his best friend. And they tied his body to a slot machine because the slot machines were, were a form of Ill- illegal gambling. To make the point that nobody, nobody must do this again. Nobody must cheat the mob again. They tied his body to a slot machine and threw it in a lake in the Catskills. That lake happened to be um, a popular lake for canoeing and swimming. And in the middle of a beautiful July afternoon with kids swimming and people sunbathing, um, Walter Sage's body popped to the surface of the lake, half decomposed because... His yeah. killers, his killers had not really correctly calculated the weight of the slot machine versus the the buoyant effects of of the body bloating underwater. So his body, you know, popped the surface. So it was it was grisly all around. Man, it it must have been it must have been a strange life, right? Because everybody's, you know, kicking and scratching to make their way. And people that would normally have not led that life saw an easy route in to making cash, right? And being a part of the mob in any facet, delivery, anything, it must have seemed like there was an allure to it because there was money to be made. But at what cost? There, there was just a bloodbath, and if you even sneezed in the wrong direction, you seemed to be executed. Yeah, I mean, it was, and of course, these were glamorous figures. The, the during during prohibition, um, these these uh, gangsters were were the way, sort of the way musicians or rap stars are today. They were glamorous figures who would you know, burst into nightclubs surrounded by women and flashy clothes and they were spending money like crazy and they were photographed by the newspapers and, you know, all the kids wanted to be like them. Um, And so it wasn't very hard for men like Abe Rella as the head of Murder, Inc. to recruit foot soldiers and uh, Abe Rellas ran his operation from an all-night can way out on the street. Teenagers by Abe Rellas. and um, and and once they were once they were um, incorporated into Abe Rellas' operation, um, many of them tried to get out, and of course they couldn't get out because they knew too much. And so um, what would often happen is that these men would have debts and then um, Abe Rellis' loan sharks would loan the money, but then they they were trapped. They could never pay off the loans. It was just, you know, it was just impossible to pay off those loans. Right. And so the, the only way they could pay off loans was to do more work for the mob. And so they were trapped. If they didn't do more work for the mob, 
and they had the debts, they knew what was going to happen. They would be, they would be killed in a in a heartbeat. And so they were they you know they were trapped. They were trapped. There was there was no witness protection program in those days. So um, it was not possible for a to go to the to go to the police, to go to the district attorneys, because they knew that they would be hunted, really, for the rest of their lives if they, if they were found to be cooperating. Well, Michael, where was the government during all of this? I mean, were they putting together a strike force to try to disable this, or were they still kind of ostriches with their head buried in the sand, pretending that the mob did not exist? Well, bear in mind that a lot of the government was taking bribes from the, from the mob. Um, particularly at the at the local level I mean it was pretty much impossible um, for a long stretch of time for uh, anybody in the mob to um, to be prosecuted in New York for example because the mob was so wealthy that they were not only paying off the, the local cops in the neighborhood in some cases, they were also paying off the judges. And so this exercise would occur in which the cops would arrest mobsters, often on just trumped up charges. It was usually vagrancy, just as an excuse to get them off the street. And they would haul them in and um, they would they would be bailed out and they would you know they would the a judge would also just dismiss dismiss the charges um and nobody you know sometimes that was because nobody would testify against them sometimes it was because the judge was was um was corrupt and so you know for a long period of time they were you know that expression untouchable they really were they really were in touch untouchable they were because of their wealth and because of their organization, they were um, as powerful as, arguably as powerful as the local officials were, as powerful as the mayor was. They could really do what they wanted, and everybody was intimidated by them. That's unbelievable. It's just what power they wield and that the, everybody was going along. Was it because... Of the financial constraints of the country at that time, that it was easy to get these people in their pockets, or has that never really stopped, even during times of prosperity? Well, I mean, the the funny thing about about prohibition is, if you think about it, is that it was a time of 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 great um, poverty in the country and the the depression. Um, and yet, and yet, ironically, it's when when the mob became um, really became prosperous, became became wealthy. Um, but later, you know, later, as we discussed in that period after prohibition, the mob was so organized. I mean, organized crime became organized, and um, and they were moving their talent around the country as they as they needed to. They were borrowing. Um, they were borrowing from each other's talent pools, um, and they were using their brain trust um, efficiently. They were really, um, they were really unstoppable. Well, let's take us to um, when it starts to fall apart for them, and how this, as you said, uh, brotherhood betrayal began. Yeah, the Brotherhood Betrayed refers to a period when Abe Reles, whose nickname was Kid Twist, when Kid Twist um, was ar arrested along with some of his closest cronies, the New York City um, district attorneys did something very smart. They put them in separate jails in separate parts of New York. And this was a technique that allowed the prosecutors and the police interrogators to isolate these mobsters from one another. And that was really, 
the district attorney's best friend was to keep these guys isolated from each other. Um, they became, you know, the isolation bred paranoia and they were worried that about who was talking. Um, they were worried that their best friends might be the ones to break and tell the police everything. Um, and it was like musical chairs. They did not want to be the one to be to be left out when the music stopped. They wanted to be um, the informant. They didn't want to be the one who was informed on, because the one who was informed on was most likely going to be prosecuted, most likely going to go to Sing Sing, and most likely going to go to the electric chair. So their lives depended on playing this, this kind of cat and mouse game. And Abe Rella's kid twist, um, he decided that he was not going to be the one to be left holding the bag. And he um, contacted uh, William O'Dwyer's office. William O'Dwyer was the district attorney in Brooklyn. And he said he was ready to talk. As I mentioned earlier, there was no witness protection program. But in the middle of the night, he and William O'Dwyer sat in the municipal building in downtown Brooklyn, and they hammered out a deal. And the deal was that Abe Rellas would tell everything he knew about hundreds of murders, and in return, the district attorney's office would do whatever they could to get Abe Rellas's um, whatever charges there were against Abrella's dismissed and, and, and would protect him and his family. Um, what the, what the district attorneys did not. So they're willing to work this deal with a guy who is essentially the trigger man and, and one of the biggest yes. assets of the murder group. They're willing to let him go in order to take down the rest of the, the pillars. Yeah. And the reason that they wanted to do that is, because while he was the head of Murder Incorporated, the assassination squad, what they really wanted was to get Abe Rellis's bosses. And those were the really famous gangsters like Lucky Luciano um, and Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Shapiro. They really wanted to get the celebrity bold-faced name gangsters while Abe, while Abe Reles was the most murderous of all these people, he was not famous in the way that Lucky Luciano was. And so if the prosecutor's ultimate goal was to boost their own careers, they wanted to be known as the guy who got Lucky Luciano. And so they were willing to make a deal with Abe Reles if it meant that they were known as the prosecutor who sent Bugsy Siegel to the electric chair. So it's more for, about big get as opposed to yeah. the true violence or the true nature of the crimes. They just wanted the celebrity. Yeah. Angle. I mean, I'm giving you a slightly cynical version of all this. They wanted to shut all of this down. But there was a big part of them that wanted the glory of taking down the, the, big, the big gangsters. And so what they hadn't really... Now, if you, if you were in a room with Kid Twist, you might not have that much confidence that he could convey a lot of information or that he could perform on the witness stand. He had a funny kind of lisp. He looked almost deformed. He was a thuggish character, and by his appearance, seemed maybe like he was not that bright. However, he was bright. He was actually brilliant, and he had a cinematic memory, an unbelievable memory for all of the details, for hundreds of murders. And so after he and William O'Dwyer had made this deal, Kid Twist started to talk 
and he didn't stop talking for weeks. And he filled these transcription books with information. And the stories were so grisly that the prosecutors have said that the stenographers who were taking down what he said, that they sometimes had to ask for a break and go out into the hall to compose themselves because they felt sick by what he was saying. Murder after murder after murder. The way that Murder and Kill People was efficient, but it was often really sadistic. These were men who killed because they were ordered to, because it was their job, but they also murdered for pleasure because they liked it. And so what Kid Twist told the district attorneys in these one all-night session after another was just a unbelievably gruesome litany of murders. And so at that point, William O'Dwyer realized that if he could keep Kid Twist alive, that he would not only be able to send the big mobsters to the electric chair, but that he would be able to send dozens of other mobsters to the electric chair as well. And this was the great betrayal that Kid Twist, the man who had killed betrayers for his, li for his living for a decade, was now the biggest betrayer of all. Wow. Why, why would, I guess self-preservation is a pretty strong reason, but I was going to say, why would someone like that flip? Do you think it was cathartic for him in a sense? And I'm not trying to romanticize the situation, but to kind of get off his chest all that had happened, especially if a memory is that, as you said, cinematic in scope and, and detailed, I can't imagine what living like that and with that knowledge and information must be like. Well, I have, an, I have a partial answer to that question. But first, I want to say that, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you met Kid Twist, you might think that he was an imbecile. But in fact, he was brilliant. And, and he was sort of playing a chess game three moves ahead of everybody else. And I think he had probably figured out that this game, after, after a decade of of profit and success that the game was starting to come to, to an end for at least for this chapter. Of so he market. already saw, he saw the I, foundation. Fumbling. I suspect he saw what others did not. And that, and that was that things were closing in on all of them. But the other part of this was that he thought he was dying as he sat in jail he began to spit up blood and the the blood didn't stop and he he believed incorrectly that he had cancer and he thought that he was going to die one way or the other he thought he was either going to go to the electric chair or he was going to or he was going to die of cancer and so he didn't really care anymore he knew that he, he believed that he, if, in fact, he didn't have cancer, but he thought that he was going to die in any case. And um, there's a way in which he was doing this, doing this for his family. He wanted to have the district attorney's office protect his family after he died. So again, it was that whole self-preservation aspect of it. Um, once he regales him of all this information, now again, it's real easy to sit there and point the finger of blame at everybody else when you're a cold-blooded murderer. How much stock do they give to this guy and his story? And especially if he does give off this air of kind of ignorance. Yeah, well, what he's trying to build is, that. What he says in this sort of fascinating scene in the middle of the night in the district attorney's office is, you know, because Kid Twist had been hauled into jail dozens and dozens and dozens of times and always gotten off because of corruption, 
he had a kind of law school education. He understood how all of this worked. And so on the night in question, when, he, when they made this deal, he said to them, yes, I can tell you about hundreds of murders, but more importantly, I can tell you how to corroborate what I'm going to tell you. So he could say, we killed so-and-so and buried him alive out by Jamaica Bay. Don't take my word for it. Here are three other people who can confirm that. So he handed, he handed the district attorney not just information about murders, but he handed them the entire case. How quickly does this move once they've got somebody like that in their pocket or because of the amount of claims and how much they have to do to prove that this isn't just some goofball claiming things that never happened? How long does it take for them to actually flesh out the investigation? Well, not that long. I mean, what happened, I don't, you know, I'll, I kind of give, I'll give some of this away is that, um, is that, um, there were four men who were Kid Twist's lieutenants, and he testified against all four. All four went to Sing Sing. All four died in the electric chair. But that was just the preliminary. The next stage was to go after, as I mentioned, to go after the really big bosses. Lucky Luciano... Bugsy Siegel, and Lepke Bookhalter. Lepke Bookhalter was on trial. And at this point, Kid Twist and other informants were being held in protective custody in a hotel in Coney Island. And the district attorneys knew that the mob was going to try to kill them. They knew that the mob had raised $100,000 and were bringing assassins in from Chicago. They knew that the mob had snipers on nearby buildings, and they knew that the mob had snipers outside the courthouse. And so everyone held their breath. Would Kid Twist live long enough to testify against Lepke Bookhalter and Bugsy Siegel and the others? And the answer was no, he did not live long enough to testify against them. On the day before he was to testify against Lepke Bookhalter to make a hugely anticipated appearance in the courtroom, early in the morning, Kid Twist went out the window of his hotel in Coney Island, and he died. Was he trying to escape? He had money stashed away. He had mob money that he was holding for other mobsters he had that stashed away. Was he trying to escape in order to get that money and give it to his family because he believed that he was going to die one way or another? Was he thrown out the window by mobsters who paid off the police to allow, you know, to, to allow them into the, ho to the hotel room? Or was he killed by the police themselves? Because remember, when Kid Twist started talking in court, he wasn't just going to talk about the murders. Oh, he gonna, right. He was right. going to talk about the bribes. <clears throat> Eventually, he would be talking about the bribes. And it wasn't just the police who were bribed. It was city officials all the way up the ranks, practically. And so a lot of people, not just on the mob side, but also on the law enforcement side, a lot of them benefited from Kid Twist dying. So he went out the window and died, 
the police officially concluded that it was an escape attempt. And maybe it was. Maybe he was trying to get that money to his family. Most people think he was not trying to escape. Because the one thing he did not want to do was to be on his own out into the city with all of these snipers and mobsters looking for him. Most people think that somebody killed him. We just don't know if it was the police or the mob or both of them, whether they were working together to kill him. And so that's the, that's, that's the, that is the mystery of this, of this story, is who killed, who killed Kid, Kid Twist and, and why. Now, Lepke Bookholder, in fact, did go to the electric chair and he was the only one of the big mobsters who died. Without Kid Twist, they couldn't prosecute other mobsters. It was sort of over at that point. So he was that linchpin that held this entire case together. How, he was. How did he die? Was it falling, gunshot, just disappeared? No, I mean, he went out the window. He was in a six-story, six sixth-floor hotel room and he went he went out the he went out the window and broke his you know broke his spine and um uh he broke two vertebrae and um you know his his uh his organs were ruptured um and he died you know instantaneously so yeah so the question is was it his own doing or did somebody pitch him out that window Right. I mean, there's more to this story, of course. He he was when 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 he was found on the on the ground, um, kind of tangled up in his arms and legs, were two bed sheets tied together. And so it appeared that he had shimmied out the window on these bed sheets, sort of like you know like somebody who would, you know, the kind of almost like a, like a joke, you know, that people go out the window on a bed sheet, but he right. did. Now, was he trying to, the bed sheets would not have reached the ground. There were just two bed sheets, but it was long enough to reach the window underneath his hotel room. So he couldn't leave that hotel suite because he was under protective guard by the, by a dozen policemen. But if he had gotten in the window of the hotel room underneath his room, which was vacant, there wasn't anybody there, he could have easily left. And so was he just shimmying, trying to shimmy out the window in order to come in the window of that room? Maybe he was. Or maybe he was thrown out the window by the police or the mob or both. And the sheet was thrown with him simply to make it look like he was trying to escape. That's the mystery. Was he really trying to escape or did they just make it look like he was trying to escape? He had, I mean, for being such a brilliant guy, he had to see that by going rogue, not only on the mob, but on the law enforcement and government officials, he had to know his card was going to get punched. He believed that he was going to die one way or another. And there's another part of this story, which I will mention to you. And that is that his wife came to visit him the night before this happened. And by her account, they had sex in the hotel room. And then she asked for a divorce. And then she left this suite of rooms amidst an argument with him. So what what does that mean? What does that mean? Does it mean right. that he didn't care about about escape about getting out of this anymore because he wasn't going to be with his family? Was he committing suicide? <sighs> it's we don't we it's very right. it's complicated and there isn't i mean there's of course there's like a full complement of forensics but there's no there's no really conclusive evidence 
I mean, I'll mention one other thing, and that is that one of the big bosses who was going to be prosecuted was a man named Albert Anastasia. And he was a fugitive at this point because he knew he knew that that if he if he showed up, the police would arrest him. Um, he would be tried for murder. Kid Twist would testify against him. He would go to the electric chair. So on some of these nights in this hotel in Coney Island, <coughs> the police saw a man repeatedly standing on the Coney Island boardwalk. He had a long coat. He had a long nose. He had dark hair. He looked like Albert Anastasia. So was Albert Anastasia sort of casing this out, examining the hotel room and the layout of the grounds? <coughs> that's also a possibility. I mean, that's a piece of evidence that would suggest that the mob played at least a role in killing, killing Kid Twist. If that man was, in fact, Albert Anastasia, then... You know, that, that indicates that, that the mob was successful. In but people of... love a good conspiracy as well, don't they? And they love jumping to conclusions. And if somebody even remotely fits a look, that might be enough to make people yeah. want to stop and point fingers. I'll tell you one other part of this. And that is that William O'Dwyer, the district attorney, he had intended to prosecute Albert Anastasia. But at a certain point in the investigation, he removed the card in Albert Anastasia's file that was what's known as the wanted card. That's the card that tells the police to bring him in <clears throat> if they can find him. So it appears that William O'Dwyer, prosecutor, is not no longer interested in prosecuting Albert Anastasia. So why would that be? Years later, William O'Dwyer became mayor of New York. And then he very abruptly resigned and he became ambassador to Mexico. <laughs> the ultimate get on the lamb job, huh? Exactly. Get him out of town. <laughs> So, what did William O'Dwyer know about police corruption? He had been a patrolman on the beat in Brooklyn. Did William O'Dwyer know? Did William O'Dwyer know that Kid Twist was going to talk about people close to William O'Dwyer? taking bribes was kid twist going to talk about William O'Dwyer taking bribes did William O'Dwyer know the kid twist was going to be killed it's a real possibility <clears throat> it seems unthinkable and kind of fantastic to think that the mayor of New York would you know would right. be involved in something like this but if you look at the evidence it's a real it's a real possibility how does this affect and impact the government and the mob going forward? Did they have to figure out a way to regroup or did they just smile, shrug and move on? Well, what happened is, I don't know if this really answers your question, but what happened is the world war two happened. And all of this, all of these prosecutions, were suspended, really. Nothing happened during World War II. Um, and in fact, part of what's, I think, so interesting about this story is that the authorities and the mob who had fought each other so bitterly through all these years became collaborators during World War II. The Italian mobsters hated Mussolini because Mussolini had really um, cracked, not just cracked down on them, but had 
abuse their families. And so, you know, they had a, the law enforcement and the, the mob had now had a common enemy in Mussolini. And so when there were a couple of cases of sabotage in the New York City dockyards, a ship called the SS Normandy burned, may have been arson. Some intelligence officers, at least one of whom had worked as a district attorney, they went to Lucky Luciano, Lucky Luciano, who was now in jail in upstate New York, and they said to him, would you be willing to help us? And he said, yes. And there, was, there were no more cases of arson on the Brooklyn waterfront or the Manhattan waterfront because Lucky Luciano used his apparatus to make sure that um, the longshoremen on the docks police the docks so that there was no infiltration of any kind. And when the Allied forces invade, invaded Sicily and later mainland Italy, Lucky Luciano was really important in laying the groundwork for that by using his mafia contacts in Italy as a kind of resistance team in Italy. And so when the war was over, Lucky Luciano was released from prison and sent back to Italy on the condition that he never come back to the United States. Huh. What strange bedfellows crime and punishment make, right? And what they're willing to accept, what they're willing to dismiss, and what they're willing to proceed in prosecuting. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, one of the amazing ironies is that Thomas Dewey, who had sent Lucky Luciano to jail, was later governor of New York. And as governor of New York, he was the one who signed the release papers for Lucky Luciano. So he put Lucky Luciano in jail, and then he released Lucky Luciano. But the Jewish mafia never, you know, I've thought about this a lot. The Italian mafia, after generations and generations and generations, kind of picked up where it left off after World War II. But the Jewish mafia did not. The Jewish mafia, I can't say that it didn't exist, but it wasn't like anything like it was before. Um, Abe Reles and his cohorts were all Jewish. Kid Twist was Jewish. Those Jewish gangs in Brooklyn that were allied with the Italians, they just didn't, they just never existed again after World War II. At least not in that vein. Uh, do you believe yeah. that the mob has ever returned to that kind of prominence? Or are they just better at being covert about it? Well, I mean, the kind of one of the things that seems so interesting to me is that most of us know the mob best from movies like The Godfather or Goodfellas, those Martin Scorsese movies. But the truth is that the, the mafia as depicted in those movies or those books was not nearly as powerful as it was in those er, in that earlier era. And we don't know as much about that early era. But that era, era that I described when the mafia was really a coast-to-coast -coast operation, they were far more powerful than they were in the later years. 
the book, A Brotherhood Betrayed, The Man Behind the Rise and Fall of Murder Incorporated, comes out officially October 6th. We do have a link up for the book so that you can pre-order the book now. And please remember, folks, do rate and review the books because that goes a long way to help out our guests and get their books out and in the public eye. What was some of the biggest um, aha moments for you in reviewing this story and, you know, kind of re-examining this famous aspect of our history well i think it was the ethnic aspect i mean we think the stereotype is that the (coughs) excuse me is that the um is that the italians are the are the tough guys and the and the jews are the money guys that's the stereotype right but in this era the jews were the toughest of all because the italians delegated the killing the killing to them I mean, another thing that we didn't really talk about is that the relationship between Hollywood and all of this. Well, Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood made these guys glamorous. Right. And that was a lot, if I understand correctly, from reading the biographies I've read and the stories that have taken place, the mob was trying to infiltrate Hollywood quite often and was actually there was a hit put out on uh, Jimmy Cagney at one point when he was the um, president of the screen actors guild, I believe George Raft stepped in for him to, you know, try to back off what was going on. But there was, there was quite a bit of contention and irritation amongst how they were portrayed in the gangster movies at the time. Wasn't there? Yeah. I'll tell you one very quick story. If, if, if we have time for it, there was a gangster named big Gengi Khan. He was a gunman for Kid Twist. <coughs> Excuse me, and he uh, he was um, he was made to kill his best friend, which is often the way this worked. They would assign the best friend to kill somebody, and then he Big Gangi figured that he was the next to be killed, so he just took off, and nobody knew what happened to Big Gangi. And then one day, the Jewish mob is watching a movie in a movie house in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And it's a movie about a it's a movie about a musician who becomes a boxer to make money. And there in the movie is Big Gangi Cohen. He's in the movie. And Big Gangi Cohen <clears throat> had gone to Hollywood. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he had he had started to play roles in Hollywood. So his way of hiding was to play a gang was to play gangsters in gangster movies. And that worked until they spotted him on the big screen. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. I know in reading George Raft's, I believe it was George Raft's biography, he, uh, after the uh, screening of the movie Scarface, the original starring Paul Mooney, um, <laughs> George Raft was picked up by Capone's men. And they were upset. They wanted to know how this movie company knew these things and knew some of the inner workings. And Raph told him, uh, you know, I told him and they started to get mad. And he's like, listen, did you want them to portray you as these dandies as, you know, and, and a real slight against it? Or did you want them to get some of the aspects correct? And from my understanding, that kind of ingratiated him to Capone's clan and they, they got a kick out of it. They just didn't like the fact that the, at the time, the, the movie code was that the gangsters always had to die. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, these, so, um, you know, George Raft was very close friends with Bugsy Siegel, who was sort right. of the, the gang's guy in Hollywood for many years. <clears throat> and they were, they were very, very close friends. And, um, you know, a lot of the mob rubbed off on Raft, and then a lot of Hollywood rubbed off on, on Bugsy Siegel. Um, and they, you know, they helped each other out. They, they each, you know, they each got something out of the, out of the friendship. What a strange, strange world there. You know, it's always interesting to me to see the way the celebrities, um, of the time were treated. And in some instances, your, your Bugsy Siegels, your Bonnie and Clyde's, your John Dillinger's were more popular than some of the leading movie screen idols of their time. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of that, as we said earlier, has to do with Prohibition. When, you know, before Prohibition, these mobsters were considered to be um, public enemies, public nuisances. 
Um, nobody, nobody wants to be threatened. Nobody wants there to be a murder in their neighborhood. But during Prohibition, they were, they were, you know, really kind of performing a public service by bootlegging. Um, and so, and the public was complicit, right? The public bought drinks. The drinks were supplied by the mob. Um, and they were lo- these larger than le- life, kind of almost heroic figures. And they were glamorous. They had, of course, they were surrounded by beautiful women. And they drove the biggest, shiniest cars. Um, they were anti-heroes. Um, and they were, um, they were really larger than life. Great stuff. Uh, why do you think that the mob, Murder Incorporated, Capone, Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, why do you think that these stories still resonate? Why are people so infatuated with Bugsy Siegel and Lucky Luciano and, you know, just that kind of culture? God, that's a good question. That's a good question. I wish I had a really smart answer to it. I do you don't. think it has to do with kind of the spit in the eye of the man, if you will, that these all kind of were slaps at normal life, normalcy, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I used the word anti-hero a moment ago, and I think that's probably as close as I can get to 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 an answer. They were, um, there was some way in which they were, um defying defying the law and doing it with great style you know they were they were um they were sort of flipping the bird at the law while they were living in the waldorf astoria and dating movie actresses and um you know who who can resist the glamour the glamour of that um they were, um, they were, you know, they were, uh, they were antiheroes, um, and they were, they were a new kind of a new American idea in the sense that they were fulfilling the American dream. They were self-made men. They were businessmen. They were highly successful, but they were not conforming. They were nonconformists. Well, get the book, read for yourself. We've only scratched the surface, and this is a fascinating read. A Brotherhood Betrayed, The Man Behind the Rise and Fall of Murder, Inc. Michael Canal, our guest. We have a link up to the book so that you can pre-order it and get it for yourself. Michael, thanks again for stopping by. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Hey, this was fun. I really appreciate it. All right, kids, you know what that means. Time to shake open the case files, and oh, they're full this week. We've got more dumb crimes stupid criminals it's it's crayon news story time what happened with this dude christ bear i heard he uh cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony suspect pulls gun from butt shoots twice at denver police what is your emergency i need help and what's the problem I was too high. You're too high? Yeah. All right. As is always the way, Tim, before we start with Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals, we should just, again, remind people, the changeover is here. It's coming sometime in the next few weeks. We'll be switching over to our new platform, which is exciting news, folks, because for those of you that have been paying $5 a month to get this program, thank you. Honestly, Tim and I thank you from the bottom of our heart. It has helped to keep both shows alive because there's not a lot of money in podcasting, believe it or not, folks. Um, it's, it's a decent business, but it's not enough to survive on. And especially for two guys with two different families, your help and support has been so amazing by keeping the show alive and and keeping your, your honor in. Now we're excited to tell you that we will be switching over soon. Not quite yet. Um, keep checking darknessradio.com or our YouTube channel, uh, or our social media. If you follow us on social media, we'll update you to the changeover, but we're going to be switching over to Stitcher premium. 
what that means is your five dollars now gets our show plus the archives of darkness radio and all of the other great content available on Stitcher Premium. But hold off signing up over there quite yet. Could you please just wait until we move over there so that they can see you coming with us? We'd really appreciate that, honestly. But um, either way, we'll see you over at Stitcher Premium very soon. Uh, we've listened to you guys for years. We know that you've had problems and complaints, and we've had them with uh, Patreon and what they were able to do or not do uh, and their lack of customer service. And it's been just as frustrating for Tim and I as it has been for you. So for those of you that stuck with this, thank you so much. And I know that we've lost over half of our paid audience because they've written to us telling us they just couldn't take the poor customer service from Patreon anymore. They couldn't take the disconnections and the issues. That's going to go away. Stitcher Premium is the new way. It's going to make it easy. People love it. It is so much easier, and it'll be a great way to find our show, our archives of Darkness Radio, and all the other great content as part of their Stitcher Premium package. So thank you again. And again, just keep checking in, and and, uh, we will be alerting you on our website. So if you come to Patreon and it's not there anymore, check darknessradio.com, and we'll let you know how you can resubscribe and get back into uh, listening to the best in true crime talk radio. So without further ado, because God knows we need no more adios, Tim, let's get (laughs) into some dumb crimes and stupid criminals. Oh, this is great. Uh, We're going to Naples, Florida, Tim. Ah, yes. I know it's hard to believe Florida, but we're going there where a Miami man was arrested for a DUI on Sunday after speaking fluent English to deputies while claiming to not be able to speak English. Hmm. Deputies pulled over Alexander Alvarez Fernandez, age 29 of Miami near Pelican Marsh Boulevard on airport pulling road in Naples According to the Collier County Sheriff's Office, Alvarez Fernandez reportedly agreed to DUI field tests after explaining to uh, to deputies that he had just come from the Havana Blue Lounge. Alvarez Fernandez attempted to walk away several times, even trying to urinate on the side of the road twice before (laughs) deputies intervened. According to the arrest report, deputies say Alvarez Fernandez spoke fluent English throughout the entire incident, even laughing and saying, this is stupid while attempting the field sobri- sobriety tests. Sobriety, Tim. Sobriety. I can't even say the word. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, and listen, we've got uh, alarms going off outside. So it's it's exciting. It's like there's crimes taking place right here. They must have Alvarez, heard you say sobriety. And then, yeah, they're, yeah, they're on Alvarez their way. Fernandez was handcuffed and arrested when he suddenly claimed he could not speak English. <laughs> so like halfway through this, he's like, hey, man, no comprende de inglés. I don't know why he suddenly sounded Rolf the dogish as well. But when asked to take a breathalyzer, Alvarez Fernandez reportedly said, I don't speak English. Deputies then called upon a Spanish speaking deputy to ask the Alvarez Fernandez gentleman to take the test. The man ignored the request, deputies say, because apparently he couldn't speak Spanish either. <laughs> it was Spanglish. That's what yeah. he spoke. Yeah. Alvarez Fernandez is facing a DUI charge, Tim. <laughs> Listen, I can't take your tests. I don't speak or understand English. Why can't you understand this? <laughs> Moron. Well, there's there's even better news where it comes to uh, Florida DUI people, Tim. Mm-hmm. When a sign warns you to drive sober or get pulled over, mm-hmm. about the worst way possible to test that claim is by, by running the sign over. Oh, my. The digital sign belonged to the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office in Florida. Officers arrested Bounty Cheremy, 22, of Northport, Florida, for driving under the influence after he hit the sign. Jeremy was arrested after officers found him in a damaged Mazda near the sign. Officers said that he claimed to be on the phone with a friend at the time of the crash and that he had been studying with a friend before getting behind the wheel that night, uh, studying a couple of drinks. In this case, the gentleman who was driving had no idea he had even hit anything. Charlotte County Sheriff's Office Public Information Officer Claudette Bennett told NBC2 he was oblivious to the fact that he ran over the sign. According to the arrest report cited by NBC2, Jeremy failed field sobriety tests and blew a blood alcohol content of .166 in a breathalyzer. That's over twice Florida's legal blood alcohol limit. 
In addition to the DUI charge, Jeremy faces property damage charges for hitting the sign. The Charlotte County Sheriff's Office sign was put on a median to remind drivers of the consequences for driving drunk. It's part of a larger drive sober or get pulled over campaign where the slogan means exactly what it says, Tim. Should have heeded that warning before getting into the car, man. Uh, you so drunk you hit the don't drink, uh, drink and drive sign. I uh, hmm. I accidentally hit a, uh, a uh, municipality sign once. Were you drunk, though? Uh, I was under the influence of a, a, a neuropathy medication, which they had to switch oh, but, up my medication. But it, it did but it force was, It was an accidental deal. It wasn't something that you'd taken no, to... No, no, I did nothing I took to uh, alter my mood. It was, right. it was meant to uh, tamp down my neuropathy pain. But uh, nothing scarier than when you're driving and all of a sudden you lose consciousness. It's, yeah. it's pretty bad, pretty bad. Yep. Well, there might be something scarier than that, and we'll cover that in a few minutes, Tim. Okay. But first, let's go to Moorhead. Minnesota? Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Where a man stabbed his roommate over a sex doll, according to court documents. (laughs) Oh, boy. If I had a nickel for every time you and I fought over the sex doll in college, Tim. Well, there was only one. (laughs) A Moorhead man is facing multiple charges after documents say he slashed his roommate because he touched the suspect's sex doll. 36-year-old Matthew Gilbert is charged with two counts of felony, second-degree assault, and one misdemeanor count of fifth-degree assault. Court documents say Moorhead police were called to the 200 block of the 17th Street South just before 9.30 Tuesday night for a report of an assault with a knife. When the officers arrived, the victim indicated that he had been cut with a knife by his roommate and had lacerations to his hands and face and was bleeding badly. Now, I'm not laughing at the victim, folks, nor am I laughing at his wounds. I'm laughing at the ludicrous situation. The victim told officers he went in Gilbert's room earlier and said at some point he had covered Gilbert's sex doll with a blanket. Documents say when Gilbert got home, he confronted the victim for touching his sex doll. The victim said the two argued until the victim says he went outside for a cigarette, and when he attempted to re-enter the apartment, the door was locked. Documents say Gilbert soon opened the door, and a physical altercation began. The victim off, uh, told officers Gilbert pinned him to the ground and began punching him in the face. The victim said at some point Gilbert produced a knife from one of his pockets and then began slashing. Officers also spoke with a witness to the altercation who said he had heard loud screaming coming from the apartment building and observed the fight in the parking lot. The witness said Gilbert was on top of the victim and punching him in the face. Gilbert told law enforcement the victim had uh, was pounding on the door and said he went outside to confront him. Gilbert said he grabbed a knife to scare the victim. However, a fight ensued and Gilbert acknowledged he punched the victim with the knife still in his hand. If convicted on all charges, he faces up to 17 years in prison. Where you know what you don't get a sex doll, Tim. You know, I, I the creativity is flowing here, Dave. I I would think <laughs> if if you had a roommate with a sex doll, I I'm thinking it's it's creative selfie time here. And, oh yeah. In other words, you know, you 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 set the doll up like it's dancing, and you you make it rain. You throw dollar bills at it, and you take selfies. Um, you know, and not, then you send the self guy. you send the selfies to the roommate. You know, um, you know you you. You you set up like you know selfies like the doll is in the kitchen with a cigarette in its mouth making you a sandwich after after you know you supposedly had a little play with it you know stuff like that you 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 make creative selfies and and just I guess piss so off here's my deal I wouldn't touch your sex doll Tim I know where you've been oh that's true <laughs> there's that. <laughs> All right, we've got, uh, I think, uh, one more story before we get to, I think, what might be worse than blacking out behind the wheel, Tim. Okay. Ah, for this next story, though. A 19-year-old Florida woman urinated in front of a police car and then offered oral sex to an officer to get her confiscated jewel e-cigarette back, authorities say. Madison Ann Bryant was charged on Sunday with disorderly intoxication, a misdemeanor, and offering a bribe to a public servant felony according to the smoking gun a felony it's more a favor wouldn't you say <laughs> i think so yeah she's a beautiful girl too holy cow hmm. uh sheriff deputies found bryant around 2 20 a.m sitting on the median of the u.s 27 highway in leesburg a city 45 miles from orlando bryant said she exited a nearby truck after getting into a fight with the driver her boyfriend about their relationship issues 
like willingness to blow other people for a puff off a jewel cigarette. Could that be part of it? That could be, yeah. yeah. Deputy spoke with her boyfriend, age 22, who smelled of alcohol, and he was arrested for drunk driving. They had been a par- at a party earlier and left because they were arguing. Bryant appeared to be heavily intoxicated and spoke of the many topics that did not make sense, the arrest report said. She did not initially face arrest. As she waited with deputies for a ride home, she said she needed to use the bathroom and wished to go on the side of the road, according to the arrest affidavit. A deputy offered a driver to a gas station to use the restroom. Instead, Bryant pulled down her pants and urinated directly in front of the squad car, <laughs> holding onto the vehicle's push bar as traffic passed her by. Oh, my. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hmm. Hmm. So I guess that's that's wrong first. Yep. When she pulled her pants back up, she was arrested for disorderly intoxication. While on her way to the county jail, Bryant reportedly asked a sheriff's deputy to give back her jewel vaping device, which had been confiscated by officers. Madison asked me if I was married and had children, a deputy said in the report. When he responded, Bryant stated she was not trying to F that up and that she would suck my beep if I gave her her jewel. Wow. The, off- the officer did not reply. Bryant, who was listed as working in real estate in her arrest paperwork, was released from Lake County Jail after posting $3,000 bond. Her arraignment is set for the 29th. Honey, you're 19. You can get by for a couple hours without your jewel cigarette? There's no need to offer oral sex for it. I, I just... One bad decision after another. In all, in all fairness, Dave, she has an oral fixation. If it wasn't the the, uh, the jewel, she needed something else. That's oh, thank God. Yeah. Oh, listen, people, can you hear more <laughs> I can't. police cars? So, suddenly, it's very hopping over here in it Minnesota. Is. Yeah, yeah, I see that. All right, yeah. Tim, you said there's nothing worse. There's no worse nightmare than blacking out behind the wheel. Well, there's that, yeah, yeah. Ooh, I have a story that might just change that. Folks, this is the time of the show where maybe you don't want the kids to listen. Oh, okay. Just saying. Yeah. Just for this story, pretty All much. All right. <sighs> no worse nightmare, you say, Tim. How about this? Are you ready? Ready. A wife bit off her husband's penis after he refused to get a rat out of her bedroom, police uh-huh. say. Hi. Abraham Masunda, age 52, from the Zambian town of Kitwe, was allegedly attacked by his 40-year-old wife, Mukapa, following a row about the rodent. She claimed that the animal was pestering her and became infuriated when she came home from drinks with her pals to find the rat near her bed. Feeling unable to sleep while the pesky rodent had the run of the room, she ordered her husband to get rid of it. A scuffle apparently ensued when he refused, when Mukapa, managing to sink her teeth then into his genitals, Causing a major tear. Oh. Bothwell Namasawa, <laughs> Deputy Police Commissioner for the Copper Belt Province, told the Zambian Observer the pair are essentially separated. Are, are they talking about the husband and wife or the man and his penis? I'm not quite sure at this point. I don't point. think the left and the right one, but I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. good yeah. God. Mm-hmm. Thank God they're separated. Mr. Musanda was rushed to Kitwe Teaching Hospital. Oh, that's not where you want to go. No. I just uh, want to go to the hospital with real doctors. Yep. Uh, you know, he was rushed to Kitwe Teaching Hospital for urgent medical treatment following the incident. It comes just a, a week or so after a man was arrested for beating his girlfriend's son for allegedly cutting his genitals with his fingernails. Uh-huh. Uh, Mohammed Mohammed Shar, 26, of Coconut Creek, Florida, dropped off his girlfriend at her workplace last Thursday before taking her four-year-old son to a babysitter's home. Shar or Shar allegedly attacked the boy when he became increasingly upset after his mother got out of the car, according to an arrest report. Uh, I don't need to read the rest of the story. Let's just cut that part out. Okay. All right, our final two stories are upon us, Tim. It's a bit of a a lame week in the world of crime. Um, Man snatches a shop tip jar after applying for a job. We're going to North Catasauqua, Pennsylvania. After a man ran off with the tip jar at an eastern Pennsylvania pizza shop, investigators didn't have to do a lot of legwork to track him down. See, Nicholas Mark, age 22, had just applied for a job at the establishment, leaving his name and contact information. It's a bit of uh, swift justice, Tim. Swift justice! Swift justice! A worker at Pizza de Oreo in North Catasquaqua. 
I don't know if that's how you say it, told authorities that Mark came to the shop August 26th to apply, but at one point snatched the tip jar off the counter and ran outside. The workers said he set off in pursuit, but backed off when the suspect produced a knife. Authorities said in an affidavit of probable cause. The suspect ran into the woods near the parking lot with the jar, which authorities say contained around $220. His backpack was found containing multiple items bearing his name, as well as items associated with drugs in the restaurant, authorities said. And since he had applied for the job, the staff also had his name and phone number. The pizza shop employee and other witnesses picked Mark out of a photo lineup, authorities say. Mark was arraigned Friday on Northampton County charges of robbery, theft, possession of a weapon, simple assault, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Court records don't list an attorney. A message seeking comment was left at a number listed for him. Hard to believe he had no comment, Tim. Hard to believe. I, you know, you would think a guy who incriminated himself would uh, just want to open up and tell the world. He's probably going to become a YouTube, YouTube sensation. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Our final story, Tim, a Sydney man. We're talking about Australia. We're going down under. Yeah, even further than Canada and Texas, Tim, way down under. (laughs) A Sydney man who showed up at a hospital with a blockage in his nose has made a surprising discovery. The man's case was recently published in the British Medical Journal after he presented at Westmead Hospital in Sydney West. Doctors weren't sure whether the blockage was caused by his internal organs or... By a foreign object, Tim. Hmm. Uh, he saw treatment with a CAT scan, and doctors found an object 1.9 centimeters by 1.1 centimeters lodged in his right nostril cavity, the BMJ reported. When doctors removed it, they discovered it was a capsule. Tim, a capsule. A capsule, you say? Containing marijuana. <laughs> the patient then remembered he had smuggled the capsule in his nose while in a correctional facility 18 years ago. Oh, yeah. Forgot all about that. How do you have something up your nose for 18 years and then just, oh, yeah, (laughs) that's where I put that. You know, you get busy with chores and everyday life, Dave, and all of a sudden you just remember that there's a capsule up there. It's been reported that his girlfriend gave him the capsule and he managed to successfully smuggle it in. However, he pushed it too far up his nasal cavity for it to be recovered. The man believed he had swallowed the capsule. He had forgotten about the drugs until doctors recovered them from his nose. It's not clear what doctors did with the marijuana once the capsule was removed. I hope they rolled up a little blunt right there in the uh, the ER. I'm sure they did, yeah. Yeah. 18-year-old dry, well, probably not dry. No, no, no. From the nasal, oh, God. How did it not dissolve? And that it just recently started bothering him. 18 years to have a capsule dude if i have a booger the size of (laughs) like a pinhead in my nose it drives me nuts especially if it's a little hard and crusty imagine a imagine a two centimeter uh, capsule up there that uh that's pretty big i oh god is there anything worse than having that one in there that's the whistler oh yeah Oh, my God. Well, that's it, uh, kids. Uh, exciting stuff. Big change is coming. Uh, we believe the official launch date for Darkness Radio at our new home on Midroll will begin uh, around September 21st, I believe, Tim. Yes, September it's been around that date. So uh, keep abreast of that situation. For those of you that are following us and, and already listening on the Darkness Radio app, I believe everything will remain the same for you. Um uh, for those of you uh, looking for it, you'll be able to find it on Stitcher. And uh, what, where where else will it be loaded to now, Tim? Do we uh, know this for certain? Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, the Google Play Store, all, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, your your Excited. normal yeah your normal spa- spaces and places that you normally get your podcasts, you'll be able to get uh, Darkness Radio. Just look for Scully and uh, the uh, the places where you normally get Darkness Radio. Yep. So all exciting news. Very, very exciting. That's it for this week. We'll be back again next week with more of the best in true crime talk radio. For that guy, I'm this guy. You've been listening to that show, and thank you for doing so.